Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today on our last day of the conference. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, all of our sessions will be available on our website starting next week. You can also find slides and attachments there as well. Hello um, everyone and thank you for joining us today on our last day. All right. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, we will be collecting evaluations at the end of every day, and you are welcome to enter these for a chance to win at the raffle. And at that, I'm going to pass it on to our speakers. Thanks so much, Haley. Hi, everyone. This is Rebecca Gudeman, and I'm joined by Dr. Stacy Barron. We're thrilled to have you. Um, as we get going, we uh, welcome and encourage you to go ahead and say howdy in the chat and um, let us know your affiliation and, and, and or profession. And if you have any specific um, topics or points you're really hoping to hear us talk about today or, or burning questions, and we're going to try to make sure we incorporate that as we go along. Um, this is a training that, this is the first time we've tried this, but Stacy and I actually pre-recorded some parts of this to make sure that we would fit time. Um, so uh, we're going to cover sort of three broad categories of topics, sexual and reproductive reality, sort of framing for the context of what sexual and reproductive health outcomes are in foster care, then shift, uh, the broad focus will be on clinical advice on how to become a more foster friendly um, practice. And then at the end, we wanna leave a lot of time for a Q and A and live discussion. But the, the first two are going to be um, pre-recorded videos with us sort of interspersing. Um, between one and two, we will take a quick break to check in and see if there's any questions or comments or thoughts folks want want to share so feel free to um, be continue to add those to the chat as we move forward um, and so with that i'm going to go ahead and start our first video okay so in this section we're going to talk about the sexual and reproductive health outcomes for youth in care and i'll reveal some of the existing disparities that we see between youth in care and their peers not in care we live in a society where youth experiences with their bodies, their voice, their safety can be different. And too many children have had their voices and bodies ignored, neglected, or hurt by adults and don't have the power or control over the environments they live in. Now, every youth in foster care has had their own experience, but as a group, foster youth are less likely to receive sexual health education or services and are more likely to face logistical and structural barriers to accessing care, as well as face bias and discrimination that influences how they access care. All of this leads to them to experience these negative health outcomes that I'm about to present. And we can learn from all of this how to create healthcare environments and experiences to better address their needs as well as center their voices and agency. So, first statistic I wanted to share females in foster care have high pregnancy rates compared to their peers. By age 17, um, almost 26% have become pregnant, which is over two and a half times the rate we see in the general population. By age 19, about 50% of the females in foster care have been pregnant at least once, which is significantly more than we see, again, in the general population. Now, often people say, well, maybe they wanted to get pregnant, um, the, the sort of excuses for why we see such big differences. But in fact, when young people who had been pregnant were asked, was your last pregnancy wanted, and wanted was the word they used, um, about two thirds said this was not something that they wanted. This was not something they probably wanted or definitely wanted. And about 71% of young men in care said that about their last pregnancy. 
Now, critically, when a young person in care has gotten pregnant and chosen to continue that pregnancy, we actually see some really disproportionately poor prenatal and pregnancy outcomes. When young women at 17 who were carrying a pregnancy were asked about their outcomes, 21% said they'd never received prenatal care, and about 43% reported that that pregnancy ended in a stillbirth or miscarriage, which is significantly uh, more than we see in the general population. Youth in foster care also face disproportionately high sexually, uh, rates of sexually transmitted infections. Now it depends in part on the disease, but in many cases we see at least three times the rate of certain STIs in youth in foster care. So why do we see these really disproportionately poor health outcomes for youth in foster care? Well, if we use the social determinants of health framework, it can really help us understand what's going on and also think about uh, how to integrate some, uh, ex some of that knowledge into our practice and change practice to improve outcomes in the future. Um, when we trace back sort of looking at health outcomes, we see that some of the influences in a young person's life can imp impact both their risk and their behavior, how care is provided to them, and how they are able to seek and receive care. Um, so when we talk about sort of influences in the social determinants of health context, there's a number of layers, sort of uh, increasing circles that we can look, look at. It's the, the economic situation that someone lives in, it's their access to education, it's their access to consistent, stable housing, to trusting relationships. We know that when young people have experienced abuse or neglect or had many disruptions in their household, being separated from family, moving uh, from placement to placement, all of this can create trauma. And that trauma can lead to actual physical health outcomes. In fact, we know that when young people have experienced significant trauma in their childhood, it can actually lead to early puberty. Um, up to a year, young people who have experienced that level of trauma can enter puberty up to a year earlier than others. Um, we also look at sort of the communities, their access to healthcare insurance, to con um, quality healthcare services and continuous healthcare services. Um, we can look at logistical and structural and systemic barriers to care. And it's important to acknowledge as one of our social determinants of health, bias and structural racism, which have dramatic impacts on the health outcomes uh, for young people in foster care as they do in the general population. Now, just we just want to highlight a couple examples of, of the impacts some of these social determinants of health have. So first, when we're looking at uh, youth risk, um, as one example, foster youth are at greater risk of intimate partner violence due to their own trauma history. And we know that this is directly linked to a greater chance of pregnancy and a greater risk of someone uh, being the victim of reproductive coercion or what we might call birth control sabotage, which takes away a young person's ability to decide when and whether to have children. Uh, we also know in terms of risk that young people in foster care are explicitly targeted by uh, exploiters and that the majority of uh, youth who've been trafficked sexually in the United States are involved in the child welfare system. Um, unfortunately, youth in foster care are far more likely to experience sexual assault because of the placements and situations in which they live um, and the risk that they're exposed to. By age 19, um, when they asked females who grew up in foster care if they'd experienced some form of sexual assault, about 50% had. It's also important to acknowledge that um, just simply living in foster care because of the kinds of placements that someone lives in can put some logistical and structural barriers in place that make it more difficult to access health care. For example, young people who live in group homes may not be able to leave the home without explicit permission, may not have transportation. Um, this is why actually uh, school-based health care can become such an important um, 
uh, opportunity and place for young people to seek confidential care because they may not be able to when they're outside of a school setting. So these next two slides are quotes from some young people with whom we work um, that highlight some of the logistical barriers that they've faced. I won't read every one, but just as an example, one young person said in our group home, staff would search our rooms and if they found condoms, they would take them away and you would get in trouble. Um, another young person said that they were not allowed to make doctor's appointments for themselves. And when they asked to go to Planned Parenthood, instead they were redirected to a health provider that the group home preferred. So it was really literally impossible for them to go and get care from the provider of choice. Now, there are many other um, social determinants of health and ways that these determinants end up impacting how care is received or delivered, but it's really important, we think, to highlight race um, and racism. Um, and in doing so, to also highlight um, that youth who identify as Black or Native are overrepresented in our California child welfare system. So while, for example, only 5% of the general population identifies as Black, 22% of the young people in foster care um, identify as Black. And this has direct impacts on the kinds of care that they receive and how they're treated in the healthcare system. It's also important to acknowledge that youth who identify as LGBTQI plus are overrepresented in child welfare as well. In fact, in a national study, 23% of children in the foster care system identified themselves as LGBTQ. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes the reason that they are in the child welfare system has to do with the treatment and lack of acceptance they received in their uh, home of origin related to their sexual orientation or gender identity. So why does all this matter? Well, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this, but the history of um, racism um, has, uh, has directly impacted both the kinds of services that young people have received um, and their willingness to trust the healthcare system writ large. Our country has a long sordid history of eugenics laws, what we sometimes call the Mississippi appendectomy. You go in for one health care and you leave unable to have children. We also have an incredibly sordid history of medical testing without consent, um, particularly on people based on their race their sexual orientation, disability. Um, so it's no surprise that in some communities there is um, a general distrust of the medical community and it's really important for us to acknowledge that and address it when we're trying to um, work with young people who are disproportionately more likely to identify um, as Black, Native, Latinx, or uh, somewhere on the sexual orientation or gender identity spectrum. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that uh, there is still direct implicit bias in our uh, healthcare delivery and it impacts diagnosis, symptom management, treatment recommendations. Um, now this may not be you and the way you practice, but it's very likely that the young people that you're seeing who are in foster care have experienced um, some sort of implicit bias in a health care provider's office at some point in their life. And that's really important for us to remember when we're uh, engaging with them because that's a trust relationship that we're going to have to really earn um, and, and demonstrate that it's well deserved. Okay, and now I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Stacy Barron to help us understand how to take some of this and bring it into practice um, so that we can be sure we're providing quality sexual and reproductive health care um, to young people in the foster care system. Thank you. Okay, um, so if, if you have any questions or comments so far, please feel free to include them in the chat um, and we are going to go ahead and move on to our next uh, section. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. My name is Stacy Barron. I'm an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics, and I work in a clinic serving welfare-involved youth at all of you UCLA Medical Center. I look forward to speaking about the components of a foster-friendly health practice, which are listed on the slide here. 
These are based on the Adolescent Provider Toolkit from the Adolescent Health Work Group in San Francisco. And I will show you at the end of the talk where you can access this. So let's discuss some concrete tools that you can use to best serve foster youth at your clinic. We are going to speak on the clinic environment, the intake process, clinical services, and implementing the law. And we will do this by walking a fictional client through a clinic visit. So we're gonna talk about Maya. So Maya enters the health clinic waiting room escorted by a group home staff person. The front desk hands Maya a health questionnaire to fill out. Maya sits next to the group home staffer. She answers questions on the form, which include questions about her race, ethnicity, her LMP, her last sexual activity, and how many sexual partners she has had in the last year, among other questions. So I want you to take a moment and think, what could we change to make this a more foster and adolescent friendly environment? Remember, this is your first chance to set the stage for the visit and let Maya know that you are providers that she can trust. So it's really important that the clinical environment demonstrate a foster friendliness. It's important that there are signs regarding confidentiality rules, that there's teen friendly posters and pamphlets that are inclusive, that there's material for caregivers on parenting teens, and that there's clinic hours that respond to the youth needs. All of this can be displayed in a teen area that is separate from the child waiting area. And this also pertains to intake questions. So in thinking about the intake questions that you hand out, how long are they? Are they understandable? Does a teen have a private space to answer the questions? Do they understand what is going to happen to the questionnaire after they complete it? I know some of my patients think it's gonna go into their medical record or it's gonna be handed back to their caregiver. And thinking about our case of Maya, she is sitting next to her group home staff member while answering these sensitive questions. Perhaps the answers to her questions would change if she was in a private space to answer the questions alone, and if there was explicit instructions on what was going to protect her confidentiality after she answered the questionnaire. Even in terms of nursing intake, think about how you administer the PHQ-2. Is the patient alone when answering? Or talking about the last missed period? Again, it's a patient in a private space. It can also be helpful to consider having a policy posted about alone time with provider. This slide depicts two different versions of a um, flyer that we developed for our clinic. Um, in the second version, it also has a line where the caregiver can circle yes to wanting to speak to the provider alone for themselves as well. Um, and this sort of sets the tone or the visit and also makes it that we're not treating your team any different than any of the other teams that come through. This is our clinic policy to offer every team alone time with their doctors. And it also explains why that's important. So when thinking of the needs of a clinic, it's also so important to incorporate the youth voice. We asked our youth advisory board to create their ideal, ideal foster health clinic, and this is what they designed. They said things like a quiet atmosphere, safe sex books in the waiting room, 24 seven access, and professional staff, as well as many other points listed on this slide. So now I'm going to pass it back to Rebecca to discuss implementing the law. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Okay, thanks, Stacey. All right, so this next section is to um, talking a little bit about the law. Um, we're going to start with a case study. So a group home brings Maya into the doctor because there's this new county protocol to encourage IUD use. The staff person shows the front desk paperwork that clearly states the group, group home has been giving care, custody, and control of Maya and that consent for healthcare has been signed over to them and they say they would like Maya to be fitted with an IUD. So our first question to you is who consents for the IUD? We want you to just think about your answer um, to yourself. Do you think the staff person consents? Does the youth consent? Does Maya consent? Or does it depend on the paperwork that they bring in? 
So this is actually um, an area of the law that confuses a lot of people. It's important to know that children and youth in foster care share the same minor consent rights as all adolescents. Going into foster care does not change their rights to consent. So minors of all ages can, care, uh, can consent to the prevention and treatment of pregnancy at any age, including contraception, pregnancy testing, prenatal care, abortion. They can uh, consent to diagnosis and treatment of sexual assault at any age. They can consent to the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of STIs and HIV starting at age 12, and to uh, diagnosis and treatment of communicable diseases at age 12, as well as outpatient mental health and drug and alcohol treatment at age 12. We do have a chart available, and we'll show you our website where you can download it that summarizes all of these minor consent charts um, and how uh, all these minor consent laws and how they apply to young people in foster care. Okay, so let's uh, now turn to the other big legal question that often comes up, confidentiality. And we'll again do this with a uh, uh, case. Ines is 14 and in foster care. Her foster parent brings her to a regularly scheduled doctor's visit. And when Ines is called into the exam room, her foster mom joins her. The provider explains that every youth receives a few minutes alone with the provider and that the provider will be asking foster mom to step outside in a little bit. Foster mom says, actually, I'm required to be with Ines at all times, and foster mom refuses to leave. So how does the clinician handle this? Well, it's really important, again, to know the law. In the same way that children and youth in foster care have the same rights to consent as other adolescents in California, Children and youth in foster care share the same confidentiality rights as all California adolescents. So that means that they have the right to patient confidentiality regarding any minor consent medical services and records unless there's a written consent to disclosure or, or there's a court order. So um, unless the minor specifically authorizes release of information, um, we're not allowed to disclose it to anyone else, even a social worker uh, or a foster parent. They also have the right to privacy in examination or treatment by a medical provider unless the youth specifically requests otherwise. Um, so again, what does this mean in practice when you have a situation like Ines's? If a youth receives reproductive and sexual health services or asks questions about sex, contraception, or other topics during a health appointment, the provider cannot share that with the youth's parents, caregivers, group home, social worker, probation officer, or anyone else without the youth's written consent. Now, how do we talk about confidentiality in the clinical setting? I will pass it back to Stacy to help uh, walk us through that. So being confidentiality conscious is really important. So for all sexual and reproductive health appointments, it's really important to separate all patients from anyone accompanying them, regardless of the age or the stated relationship. The provider needs to establish confidentiality and limits, and this flyer here on the right is something that depicts that. It is also important to recognize that the reason for the visit may be a different answer in front of an adult than in private after assurances of confidentiality have been made. In terms of the principles of communicating conditional confidentiality, it's really important to explicitly define confidentiality, to provide specific information regarding when confidentiality might be breached that is specific to the individual in front of you, to use developmentally appropriate language and concepts, keeping it simple and concrete, and be genuine. You have expressed to us feeling like it is just something the provider has to say and does not carry meaning. So really important to be genuine in these conversations. So these are pictures um, of practice tools for communicating conditional confidentiality, and they come from the Adolescent Provider Toolkit section on confidentiality and consent from the Adolescent Health Working Group. The citation is on the slide. And again, you'll be directed to this resource at the end of the talk. So before we return to our case, I also want to discuss something that was really helpful for our clinic in terms of improving our clinic environment. 
And this is making a process map of how a patient walks through clinic from the very beginning to the very end to look for opportunities. This is an example of our process map, and we identified seven process points that were ripe for intervention in terms of improving our adolescent friendliness. So back to our patient, Maya. So the medical assistant comes out to greet Maya and invites her back into the exam room. They enter the exam room, Maya sits slumped in a chair, the medical assistant reviews Maya's forms and asks Maya what she is there for. Maya looks all around and in a bored, almost annoyed voice says she thinks she might have a UTI. So how should the clinician interpret Maya's behavior? It's really important to use inclusive and trauma-informed engagement. This chart lists both a non-trauma-informed interpretation and response to Maya acting bored and impatient, as well as a trauma-informed interpretation and response. So I want to focus on the trauma-informed on the right-hand side of this table. The provider could think, what is going on in this environment or in the youth's history that is triggering this response? The provider could consider presenting observations to the youth, and ask for feedback slash ask if anything is needed. And let's remember that Maya was seated with her group home staff member in the waiting room, was filling out confidential information sitting next to this caregiver, and perhaps that just did not set the tone for the visit in the right way. This slide also comes from the Adolescent Provider um, Toolkit um, on a section on trauma, and it really helps providers with a strength-based approach um, in terms of discussing with adolescents, focusing on external and internal assets. So it's time to take a sexual health history with Maya. How should the clinician handle this knowing Maya is in foster care? Some tips for talking to youth in foster care include removing distractions, negotiating the agenda, avoid jargon or complex medical terms, listen and don't assume or jump to conclusions. Explain what you're going to do from the beginning to the end. Remember that someone's first sexual experience may not have been consensual. Always ask the youth if they have any questions. And in this manner, you're really being inclusive, client-centered, strength-based, and trauma-informed. Some examples of provider youth communication um, is listed here. So saying something like, do you have someone to talk to about sex and relationships? How do you feel about having sex? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? And as always, it's so important to hear from foster youth on what they want. So to this end, all of these recommendations and quotations are from the LA Rep Youth Advisory Board. They said, don't start by asking us why we are in foster care. It's important to be non-judgmental, to avoid attacking or blaming to ask us what we are comfortable with, to let us know that you are there to help us, to let us know that we can come forward with questions, to go above and beyond, to watch for body language signals that show we are uncomfortable, acknowledge it, and use it as a sign to change the communication tactics. And we saw this in the case example of Maya. So to further this, the youth said phrases they like to hear are, let me know if there's any way I can help you. Or if I say something wrong, please stop me and let me know. I'm here to help you and I don't mean to hurt you. So Maya is interested in birth control and wants to know her options. How should the clinician handle this knowing Maya is in foster care? So some tailored health services and counseling include LGBTQ friendly and culturally competent and inclusive language. Determine the client's need and desire for contraception. Provide sexual as well as reproductive health care. It's always important to screen for sexual assault and reproductive coercion, and to also assess relationship quality and discuss characteristics of healthy and problematic relationships. When doing birth control counseling and STD screening, want to respond to the client's needs. Consider what is in the client's control and what isn't. Consider resources available and what's not available. And also recognize the unique circumstances regarding control of private space and schedule, resources, and needs for some foster youth. I want to go back to our inclusive and trauma-informed engagement slide and look at this example 
of a youth you have just counseled about birth control, who told you she didn't want to get pregnant, but she just told you she didn't use birth control last time, and she's now pregnant. And so there's both the non-trauma-informed and the trauma-informed response to this. Um, and I just want to highlight on the right-hand side the trauma-informed interpretation and response for the provider to think, what's going on in this youth's life that she was unable to align her stated intent with actions? And this can be really helpful when it comes to um, tailored health services and counseling. So speaking specifically about counseling about long-acting reversible contraception, it is important to ensure that young people can make informed choices about their reproductive health. It is crucial that healthcare providers are aware of the history of LARCs and offer comprehensive counseling for contraception that acknowledges a history of discriminatory practices and addresses concerns that individuals may have about the use of LARCs. LARCs may be a good option for foster youth and they may not be for others. Be aware that communities of color have experienced coercive and discriminatory practices related to the reproductive choice they have. And they, have, they may have negative associations with the use of LARCs. So it's really important to provide comprehensive counseling. And presenting LARCs in a client-centered and inclusive way can include phrases such as, I'm going to present you with options, but it is your body and it is your choice what you think is best for you. And this graphic from bedsider.org is a great educational tool for clinic that shows all of the different options and can help using pictures, um, the provider to go through all of these different options to come up with what is the best fit for the patient. So we're gonna go back to Maya again. Um, because of that, the now supportive and non-judgmental conversation, Maya seems to relax and she starts to share with you about her boyfriend. She tries to hang out with him as much as possible because she hates living in her current placement, but says he's a player and sometimes makes her feel uncomfortable with what he asked her to do. Some of Maya's comments start to raise red flags of the provider. One part of the provider is afraid that Maya's disclosures may trigger some reporting requirements. She doesn't know if she should ask more questions or tell Maya to stop talking. So what is the next step? Um, these clinical tools, again, come from the Adolescent Provider Toolkit, the Adolescent Health uh, Working Group on Discussing Healthy Relationships and Coercions. It, include, it encourages providers to use messaging that um, discusses healthy relationships. Healthy relationships are when two people are equal in the relationship, where each shows some flexibility um, in, in the relationship um, and in their behavior where each avoids assuming an attitude of ownership and where the partners encourage each other to be all that they are capable of becoming. A relationship that avoids manipulation, exploiting, and using the other. Um, and this tool, toolkit can be helpful in having these discussions with patients. This is also something that could be posted in the clinic. Um, this tool shows some tips for what to look for in a relationship. It also encourages the youth to talk with a trusting person if they think they might be in an unhealthy or abusive relationship. So as Maya started to share with you, thanking her so much for sharing this information and talking with her about this, um, because she has felt like you are a trusted support system for her. And it's really great to continue that relationship. So I just want to talk a little bit about some special protections for foster youth. Um, we're now going to use the example of Jason. So Jason is a 17 year old. He has shared that he is sexually active. On his way out after his exam, you hand him a paper bag with condoms and pamphlets. He politely declines and says his placement won't let him have the condoms and will just take them. So you might as well just keep them. So what are Jason's rights? Well, children and youth in foster care have some special rights regarding sexual and reproductive health. They have the right to be provided transportation to sexual and reproductive health related services. They have the right to obtain, possess, and use contraception of their choice, including condoms, regardless of the beliefs of their caregivers. And they have the uh, right to access age appropriate, medically accurate information about reproductive and sexual health care, the prevention of unplanned pregnancy, including abstinence and contraception, abortion care, 
pregnancy services, and the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of STIs, including but not limited to the availability of the HPV vaccination. So in terms of wrapping up the adolescent visit, it's really important to allow time for follow-up questions and to provide additional resources. Always ask for the team's input into the treatment plan. This will really help encourage adherence. It's important that you summarize findings and the treatment. It's important to schedule a follow-up appointment, recognizing that follow-up may be particularly challenging when foster youth have limited control over their schedule. And also, make sure the teen is given the office or clinic contact information, including the names of the people to call for questions or follow-ups, as well as daytime and after-hours phone numbers. It's also really helpful for the clinic to obtain the correct contact information for the youth themselves. I think it's also worth mentioning in these times of the COVID-19 pandemic that we really have an opportunity to change the way we provide healthcare um, to adolescents um, and to think of new and creative strategies to engage youth regarding sexual and reproductive health. And this is from a recent article in the New York Times. So I want to share with you as we wrap up some resources on the next three slides. This is a great uh, poster about knowing your rights and something that could easily be um, hung up in the clinic. This is a great resource for um, depicting the minor confidentiality and consent laws in California. And then here are some resources from the LA Reproductive Health Equity Project for Foster Youth at www.fosterreprohealth.org. Um, I want to point you to the pink box where you will find the Adolescent Health Toolkit that we referred to throughout this presentation. Um, you can get more information there about communicating conditional confidentiality, mapping the patient's assets, a strength based approach, as well as discussing healthy relationships um, and coercion, and then much, much more. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time. I'm gonna leave this slide up for a little bit so you know where to access any resources for your continued learning. Thank you. All right, so that is the end of our um pre-recorded session. Um, this is the slide that we finished with. We just want to give you, um, we want to encourage you to send in any um, questions, comments, cases that you may have seen. We're hoping that we can have a little bit of a discussion right now, but um, as you're doing that, just want to give you a little bit more information about the LA Reproductive Health Equity Project, or LA Rep for short. Um, this is a multidisciplinary collaborative that is based in LA County. LA County has the largest um, child welfare system um, in the state, and in fact, is the largest it is larger than many um, other states' systems, just the county alone. Um, and so we have a number of different um, agencies that are working together to try to tackle the dis disproportionate, um, disproportionately poor health outcomes that we um, talked about at the beginning, um, coming at this from many angles. So certainly working with healthcare providers to ensure that we can provide quality care, but also looking at policy and practice, working with the child welfare agency. Um, so um, the website for the Reproductive Health Equity Project is fosterreprohealth.org. And you can find a lot more of the research and background data on health outcomes, um, if you click on um, the research and data box you see on this website, um, we've done a number, we've created a number of different trainings for um, healthcare providers, but also caregivers, group homes, social workers. You can find those trainings up um, and available. Some of them are available online. Um, some basic uh, background information on child welfare and reproductive justice. And it's also important to note that um, in the last five years, the law and policy around access to sexual and reproductive health care for young people and child welfare has changed um, dramatically um, in California. And so some of the, it, for example, it 
it used to be the law in California that if someone was in a group home, they were not allowed to have their own medication um, in their own personal storage. So if they had, a, per, for example, a prescription for birth control pills, they would have to give that to the group home staff and ask for it to be dispensed. Um, that has changed. Now the practice and law is that a young person is allowed to have something like birth control pills in their own private space, um, which is really, um, really important. Um, there also are laws that require child welfare social workers to check in with young people in foster care starting at age 10 um, and on an annual basis to make sure that they have access to the information that they may want or need um, and access to, to uh, the healthcare services that they may need. Um, but for many reasons, um, uh, youth in foster care don't feel comfortable talking about um, sensitive healthcare needs and issues with their caregivers or social workers. So that's where, again, the school-based health programs can play a really, really important and valuable role creating a space for young people in the child welfare system to access services that they may want um, in, a, in a confidential way. So um, we are so excited to be here and talking to you all and thank you for your interest in this topic. Um, it looks like there's no, ah, there is, um, as providers, how would you ensure that an adolescent has access to the contraception and reproductive health resources they have a right to? Are there any current policies in place that monitor this? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, stepping back, one thing to know is that by law in California, every child in foster care, including adolescents in foster care, um, has an attorney appointed to represent their interests. Um, and that attorney has attorney-client privilege with the young person. And um, their role is to make sure that they um, are able to access the healthcare services that they need and that the child welfare agency and that caregivers are connecting young people with any services that they may want or request. Um, so if you run across a young person who says, for example, oh, well, my group home confiscated my contraception or they won't let me, you know, this is uh, a something that we also have heard is, oh, well, I have a religious um, caregiver who has told me that I'm not allowed to do X, Y, Z, or I'm not allowed to go to ABC healthcare provider. Um, uh, you can play a really important role letting the young person know what their rights are and letting them know that they could talk to their attorney um, or their social worker um, about uh, getting their rights enforced. But it also is helpful that if you know what those rights are in the first place. And the um, graphic that uh, Stacy showed in her section that was a know your rights, that was specific to foster youth. So it includes some of those additional obligations um, and protections that only foster youth have in California. Um, Another question, how do you work through consent with minors? How do you work through any cultural or religious beliefs that may be deeply held in some communities? Um, so under California law, um, youth in foster care, just like any other adolescent, have the right to consent to their own pregnancy-related health care at any age. Um, and, and there are a number of resources out there to both help explain and frame that for caregivers or trusted adults in their lives, um, but also how to explain that in an age-appropriate way to the young people with whom you're working, um, whether they're 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. Um, one reason we do have minor consent laws in this area is that we want to, we know there's a lot of research that says there are some young people who, um, because of stigma, because of concerns about their caregivers' um, beliefs or uh, judgment, will choose not to seek care if they know that they have to inform their, uh, their adult, trusted adult. Um, the vast majority of young people will involve a parent or caregiver um, by choice. Uh, but the, it is important that it is their choice to do so. Um, and this may be something that comes up in your 
um, confidential setting, they may disclose that they need um, some assistance sort of navigating that relationship. Stacy, I don't know if you've had experience of a young person exploring this issue of sort of how do I involve my, let's say their cultural or religious beliefs of the caregiver um, may conflict with somebody. Is that something that you've had practice with with any of your clients? Yeah, I actually have um, had to sort of negotiate that. And, um, you know, I wanted to mention also, uh, just before I get into that, about um, Senate Bill 89, the Sexual Health Education Act, which was passed in July of 2017, um, which um, had has four specific requirements, improving access to sexual health education, making sure foster youth are informed of their rights and removing barriers, and doing some quality sexual health training, and also requiring sexual health education for adults. Um, and you know stipulates that the foster parent cannot deny their placement access to um, reproductive health services based on their own religious beliefs. However, in practice, this does come up, um, and I have even had a situation in clinic in which a um, a teenager, after going through all of the different options, had selected uh, birth control pills um, and was in the home of a family friend and really felt that that family friend was a good ally and a good partner. And there's multiple reasons that she was on um, birth control aside from um, family planning, but it was also for control of acne and some headaches. Um, and she was uh, willing in a discussion with her to actually tell her, her caregiver that she wanted to pick up this prescription of the farm she thought that would be helpful to have her as a partner in that process um, and that she would be open to that. And so after discussing confidentially, confidentially with the youth, um, we went in together and unbeknownst to both of us, the the caregiver was very much against uh, the birth control prescription, no matter what the reason for her own religious uh, beliefs. Um, and that was very hard to undo the tone of voice that that came out with in the room and the sort of disappointment from the patient that that was a trusted provider that she might be able to partner with. And we ended up doing um, depo in clinic, which is something that could be done a lot more secretly. But um, just to say that uh, we, we did do education with the caregiver about the minor's rights and the fact that Senate Bill 89 exists, and um, it, uh, I think it becomes difficult once you get to, to that point, um, and it's definitely a tricky situation to negotiate, um, but certainly education for the foster parents are really um, is really important and then just talking about the partnership and then you know the the caregiver did not need to know at all that we were prescribing this um, we just know from our experience that when you have to go to the pharmacy and maybe you don't have transportation to the pharmacy the social worker can actually partner with you in trying to set that up for the youth so the foster parent or um, relative caregiver can be completely should be completely left out of that if that's the minor's choice um, and that's the role of the social worker to really facilitate um, getting Getting the um, getting the adolescent that that care that they need, um, but just practically speaking, when you have a 14 year old who doesn't drive and and thinks that they can rely on their caregiver in this way, I think that's it can be a really nice partnership, and then sometimes it can also go awry. So I hope that answered your question. Um, there is another question about any promising policy changes. Um, we are actively involved in moving new policy and practice. And I will mention that Stacy and the rest of our foster um, LA Rep Reproductive Health Equity Project were also part of some really new exciting interventions. This year we're going to be um, developing a, a foster youth specific online sexual health education, um, both curriculum and mode of delivery um, to try to make, sh make sure that we can break down any logistical barriers that young people in foster care may have to accessing the information they may want. Um, and we also, Stacy's clinic is uh, starting a really exciting project um, on developing a reproductive health patient navigator program to help address some of the entry and exit uh, logistical barriers and um, information barriers. And maybe Stacy, you can talk about it in a second. Um, I just wanna also add before I pass it back to you, um, someone is asking how can school-based health center providers and staff best support access in the current climate? Um, I, I don't, I want to, 
um, make sure I emphasize the value of creating that safe space and sharing information. Um, so many of the young people, we have a youth advisory board and we've worked with a number of um, youth in foster care in the community. I can't tell you how many young people um, have told us that they hit um, puberty and, um, for example, started menstruating and had never heard what that was. They didn't know what was going on. Um, don't assume that folks have received even the basic information that is now required to be delivered in California schools because young people shift around from school to school when you're in foster care. They may not have accessed it and they may not have had an adult or a parent in their life to tell them. Um, one of the young people we worked with said to me she had been in an abusive relationship and ended up having a child when she was 15. And this ended up being a, a a real powerful motivating force in her life having a child but she said you know i grew up in an abusive home that's what i thought love looked like why would i know anything different this is why it's so important to make sure that we have information and access to um, education about things like healthy relationships so school-based health centers even if you're not specifically providing um, sexual healthcare services, having information, having education, having a safe space where a young person can come and talk to you about what's going on in their lives um, can play such a powerful role. And if you want information about the policies that are coming up or new um, interventions that we're trying, we um, you can go to Foster Repro Health and sign up for our listserv and we share out updates on a quarterly, not a lot, but quarterly basis, sort of letting you know about new research, what may be coming down in Sacramento in terms of new legislation policy, um, as well as some of the interventions we're doing. Um, but Stacy, do you wanna talk about the patient navigator for a second? And remind think, me, Neely, uh, how much uh, time we have. I just want to be mindful of the time. We have eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. So um, first, um, to address the what to just um, discuss what Rebecca had mentioned about the school-based health centers. I can't say enough of how much you are valued. Um, we and we spoke to youth from the youth advisory board about the types of clinics that have served them well with regard to their sexual and reproductive health care. The school-based health clinics have received wonderful reviews because they are there by themselves. They are going by themselves. That is uh, such a nice place to really have this automatic alone time. And um, you know, the patient knows that the parent isn't sitting outside um, and you're not also often talking about a, a bunch of the other medical issues that, that we're dealing with when they're coming to the medical clinic, which can sometimes take time away from that discussion. So just a huge thank you to those of you who work at the school-based health centers and just to know that you're very much appreciated. Um, what we're developing at my clinic is um, a, what we're titling a reproductive health navigator, role, which um, will be called something different to patients, as we know that um, our patients likely won't, that won't really resonate with them. However, we're trying to solve for the fact that when patients come into a medical clinic, um, there's a lot of other um, needs that are being addressed, and, and often they are being brought in by their caregiver. And um, I know this slide with our process map was really quite small, but if anyone on this call is um, not working in a school-based health center, is in a larger medical facility. For me, it was incredibly eye-opening to just walk a patient from our waiting room um, into the intake room, to the provider visit, and out for checkout. Um, because we realized along the way, there were so many steps that perhaps signaled to the patient that I don't know if I really want to talk about these things here. And 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 for instance, um, starting with getting intake questionnaires in the waiting room while sitting directly next to the caregiver, not knowing that that intake questionnaire was not going to be put in the chart, was not going to be shared with the social worker, was not going to be then shared with the caregiver who they um, they came with, um, having having depression screening done with other um, family members or non-relative caregivers in the room and asked about their last menstrual period as well, not in private, um, and then having alone time with the provider somewhere in the middle of the visit. So um, all of this stuff happened, come into clinic with the caregiver, and then the alone time sort of happens in the middle. And so I think just by mapping that process out, we were able to look at a lot of different steps where from the very beginning of our 
our visit, we weren't signaling to the adolescents that this is a clinic for you. And we were able to redesign that process so that from the beginning, um, they know they have alone time with the provider from the start, that they have a private space to do the intake questionnaire, and that it's very, very easy to understand uh, language that says this doesn't go anywhere in your chart or to your social worker. This is just for use between your doctor and, and you. Um, so in filling that out, they could rest assured and that the beginning of the visit starts with alone time with providers. So they know from the beginning that the, the visit is for them. Um, in terms of the Reproductive Health Navigator program that we're launching, this was really to solve for the fact that oftentimes um, we, we conducted a study um, of 17 providers who all take care of uh, youth, uh, welfare-involved youth around Los Angeles County. Um, and we used a semi-structured interview guide and asked them about what they perceived as barriers and facilitators to um, sexual and reproductive um, health services for their patients. Um, and from analysis of those 17 interviews, we really identified um, four main themes. Um, one of which is that privacy is paramount so that youth really value their privacy and you have to be very explicit in how you discuss that with them. Um, another is that you might only have one chance, meaning that a lot of these kids are coming to the medical clinic. They might be court mandated for these types of visits. Um, and, and we don't know if we have another touch opportunity, which is the other advantage of a school-based health center. Hopefully you have time to build that continuity. Um, but we really wanted to know how can we maximize that, that first visit with the child and teen and, and start off on a really strong foot. Um, and one of the other themes was that um, it's, um, you know, that, that, that this idea of collaboration um, is in tension with youth privacy concerns. And like the anecdote that I shared that, you know, while it can be helpful to partner with the social worker or the foster parent, often these youth don't want, they, they want to protect their privacy and they want to navigate the system on their own, but it can be very difficult to do so and to get completion of care. Um, and so the reproductive health navigator is really someone who, um, and, and sorry, the other, the other thing is we learned also that because there's so much being discussed at a medical visit and often the youth don't exactly know why they're coming to a general health clinic. So when they're going to the school-based health center, they may ha come with a purpose. I want STI testing today. I want my depo shot, et cetera. When they're coming to us, it's for an entire medical exam. Um, and they might not know that sexual repro health was something that we are going to discuss. And they might not know what their needs are, or they might not feel comfortable to share their risk factors. And so um, we are designing designing this navigator program as a opportunity to do some universal education with our patients. This is a safe space to talk about this stuff that we want to be there for you. If something comes up after the visit and you didn't have a question during the visit, that we talk to all youth about it. So really normalizing it. And as Rebecca said, some of them have missed the basic conversations in school about periods and other things like that. And so having an ally with them who's not actually the medical provider, is not their social worker, is not their caregiver, who can do a pre-visit phone call, an intra-visit encounter, and a follow-up phone call with the patient. And then should they need something very specific, like um, an IED or an explanation, or decide that they would like something like that, can actually take them through the system and make sure that, you know, even if they don't have a car and they don't want to share with their social worker and they don't want to share with their foster parent, that they can get the type of reproductive um, health services that they want and deserve. So um, I think that was... Uh, the answer to that question, let me know, Rebecca, if I missed anything about that. That was great. And folks can always connect with us through Foster Repro Health if they want more information. And Stacy's going to be publishing a number of different papers related to the, this project. Um, I see one more question about how do we navigate ways to rebuild the caregiver relationship, um, if that's at all within the scope of the conversation. One, you know, I want to just step back and say there actually is um, research that's been done with foster caregivers, and one of the the biggest things that we heard is um, because there for so many years there was no policy or education for caregivers, many of them felt like it was illegal to talk about sexual reproductive health with young people in their homes, um, or that it might be stepping on toes. Um, we had, actually, I, I pulled this slide for time's sake, but we have a slide that contrasts a caregiver quote and a child's quote. And the caregiver says, 
well, who am I to talk to a young person about this? That's something that their biological parent, that's their biological parent's role. So I don't say anything. And then a youth says, I had 14 different placements and nobody spoke to me. And sometimes that silence can be interpreted by a young person as meaning something to be shame, shameful, um, something to be, you know, that that's saying something more. And so one of the things that Senate Bill 89 did is it now made um, training for caregivers uh, mandatory. And by training, it talks about um, what they're allowed to do, what they're required to do, but also it provides information on how to have strengths-based, culturally competent and supportive conversations with young people about sex, which is a really hard thing for all of us to do. Um, and it points to, to various resources. It can be particularly challenging when it's not your own biological child, or maybe you come from two different cultural backgrounds, and that's a real um, specific, unique issue in, uh, for caregivers. So, um, Stacey, you might have some suggestions about what a clinician can do in the moment, but I think it's also important for folks to know that there are now trainings available, and you can find some of them um, if you click the green box on this website. Yeah, and I know we, we only have a, a minute left. I think just really building trust with the youth and spending time to take them aside and, and debriefing about that and whether or not that's in the room or with a follow up phone call to their cell phone and saying, you know, how did you feel about that interaction, acknowledging that that might have been uncomfortable for them and um, really encouraging them to seek continuity of care with you and, and, and being the, providing your phone number for the clinic so that they have a way to reach you or whatever that their contact is. Um, and then also, you know, continue Continuing to build that partnership with the caregiver as well so that you can have an ongoing discussion with them. Um, and I think just being that trustworthy provider who um, they feel like they can go to is very important. But thank you all for listening to all of this and I'll, I'll leave it to Rebecca to close. I, we thank you. We appreciate it. Hope you have a good rest of the conference. Take care. Thank you to Rebecca and Stacy.